Hello, everybody. Welcome to an episode of the County Seat Underground. I'm your host, Chad Booth. Uh, we are in the process of redistricting. In 2020, a census was conducted, albeit a little bit slow uh, and uh, way behind schedule, but a census was conducted which allowed for uh, redistricting to take place so that it more equally represents the population of the state of Utah. Uh, it affects both state uh, uh, districts and congressional districts. And uh, while the process has traditionally gone on every 10 years, this is the first time that Utah has actually engaged an independent commission to uh, actually deal with the, uh, the uh, redistricting process. Uh, and it has uh, had some people give it kudos and other people give it some uh, less than favorable results, including the current Speaker of the House, uh, Brad Wilson, who thought that this situation might have been better handled by the legislature, and uh, one of the commission members, uh, and that would be Rob Bishop, who is our former congressman. Uh, we are joined today by Carl Albrecht, who is a state representative from the central part of the state, and uh, by phone or by pictureless uh, link, uh, former congressman Rob Bishop, uh, who um, is joining us for this conversation. So, um, I think I'm going to I think I'm going to start out with uh, talking a little bit about the commission, uh, and and ask Congressman Bishop just to talk about how the commission was supposed to work, and what ultimately led you to to resign from it uh, last week. Uh, well, thank you, Chad. I appreciate being on here. Um, the commission, as uh, I think has been mentioned before was established by an initiative that was voted on by the people on the very narrowest of margins. In fact, uh, it was the idea was defeated in 25 of the 29 counties. And uh, so it, it, when it was established, the constitutional responsibility for redistricting is with the legislature. And that cannot be changed, although there are, there are voices out there saying that that's wrong, but it's it's still their constitutional responsibility. So the commission became an advisory panel only. And there are some flaws, I believe, in just the structure of the commission that were illustrated as we went around trying to come up with different kinds of maps. Unlike the legislature, which represents every part of the state, and I think that's the, that's the advantage the legislature has, Commission only has seven members. They were appointed a uh, bipartisan approach. They're not necessarily accountable to any group of people, maybe those only to those who account them. And I said it was urban centric because it is. Five of the seven commissioners are on the Wasatch Front. Uh, there is nobody from Southern Utah or Eastern Utah or Southeastern Utah. No one south of a Spanish Fork that's on it. And of the five that are on the Wasatch Front, the majority are from Salt Lake County. So it's a different viewpoint that is, I think, very specialized. In fact, one of the commissioners brought a map of the state of Utah so that commissioner could finally find out where places like Wayne and Paiute County actually were in the state. That gives what I thought a, a warped perspective on what is significant and important. The other issue that I had a problem with is simply... Um, having served for almost two decades in the legislature and talking to my predecessor who served for 22 years in Congress, I'm sorry, two, two decades in Congress and Jim Hansen was there for 22 years, it became very obvious that uh, uh, the congressional delegation needs to be united on both urban and rural issues. So you have four people talking about an urban issue and four people talking about rural issues. But to do that, you have to be firmly grounded in what the, those different areas of the state, what they have to do. Uh, in, in 1910, Utah got its second representative. And since that time, with the exception of two cycles, there have always been urban and rural mixes in our congressional delegations, and it makes a difference. That unfortunately was rejected or dismissed by most of the members of the redistricting commission, which is why I think you saw the maps for Congress being maps that I think are going to be to the detriment of Utah going forward if they were adopted by the constitutionally designated legislature. Chad, I'm, I'm rambling here. Why don't you interrupt me and <laughs> let me 
Tell me where you'd well, like me to focus. Well, no, I I would actually uh, like to address that issue. There there is a there's a school of thought that says you know we should have a congressman representing. Uh, you know, mostly urban people, and and then let there be an eastern Utah representative that gets energy and oil and gas and mineral extraction, and then another congressman whose district is mostly rural and handles things like, uh, you know, grazing issues and public land issues. And you're saying that they, they both need to be a mix of both. and But the challenge in that really becomes the fact that You've got 80% of the geography that's not urban and 80% of the population that is urban, and they both rely on each other, and they're both very important. So how do you, how do you deal with and address that um, in, in districting, and, and was that part of the problem that you were trying to attend to? Um, that was a major part of the problem I was trying to attempt. I, I told you we did two cycles where we actually had a Salt Lake County-only district. And the argument that was given by the commission is, well, obviously somebody from Salt Lake can understand and represent rural Utah as well back in Washington. The fact of the matter is it didn't do that. So in 2000, when the redistricting took place, there was a conscious effort to make sure there were urban and rural parts in every district, and it was successful. That's why it stayed. That's why it was there for the bulk of the time from 1910 to 1980. Um, the, the mayor of St. George wrote a wonderful letter that was ignored by a lot of people who simply said that the lifestyle, especially in counties where you, uh, you, you have the absentee landlord of the federal government owning most of the county, is a concept that you cannot get unless you have actually been there and worked with the people who live there which is why doing it by uh, doing it by doing it like I'm doing here and trying to talk to you by radio, by telephone doesn't necessarily actually work. Um, that, like you've got counties in rural Utah that are 90% plus owned by the federal government with very little private property. The county with the least amount of public property is Salt Lake County where you have over 90% owned by private property. Unless you spend specific amount of time and significant amount of time in rural Utah talking to those people, somebody from Salt Lake really does not understand or get what it's like to have an absentee landlord. Now, that's just one issue. And that's one issue that the mayor of St. George identified properly. But there are a whole lot of other issues that deal with water, that deal with agriculture, that deal with economic development in which there's a different need in rural Utah than urban issue, urban Utah. And if you want to have a united delegation back in Washington pushing what Utah needs, I need four representatives, each who understand the urban problem and the rural problem and can address them as a united front. If we have two urban, urban districts and two rural districts, they'll cancel each other out and the net impact for Utah is zero. And that to me is significant. And that to me is what a lot of people for what I believe are partisan reasons simply wanted to ignore. So Carl, how does this affect you? You're a, you're a state representative. You've got, you've got a pretty large swath in your, in your legislative district. Uh, I think it's the second largest, isn't it? In the legislature geographically. Um, That's correct, Chad. Uh, and Congressman Bishop, hit this right on the head. If you look at the rural areas of the state, they provide the energy, the power, most of the agriculture, the water for the Wasatch Front that comes off the Forest Service through the Central Utah Project and down into Utah County, up into Salt Lake County, into the Weber Basin. Uh, they provide the recreation on the public lands, which is uh, enormous, and, and we get them every weekend. But for us not to have someone who understands public lands issues, energy issues, re recreation issues, economic development issues, it would be a sad commentary if you go, just like uh, Rob said, if you go to D.C. and that is fragmented in your representation. So that is very important. 
And I hope that the legislative uh, redistricting committee can see that. I'm going to push for it. I know other rural uh, members are as well. And that was primarily the difference between Rob's commission that he set on. You look at the map, and I did, I, I, I drew a map where those folks lived. There is not one that represented that, indes- that uh, independent commission south of Utah County. That's a travesty. And, and number two, the legislative, we, we've got senators and representatives that represent both urban and rural, who know the areas, who know the people, who know the problems. And so I think the legislature is in a much better position to fairly draw a map that represents the majority of Utah citizens. So th- that that leads me to a question, and, and it, this is a question of practicality. Rob, you have a unique position because you sat in the Utah State Legislature. You were Speaker of the House. You spent a long time understanding that dynamic, but you've also spent a, a, a rather lengthy, I think, almost uh, as significant as, as Jim Hansen's 22 years there, and, um, and or was it longer? No, it's been about, it's about the same amount of time, I guess. So, uh, But uh, y- you were kind of a reverse because you were elected to that office coming from more of a rural area, and you had to, you had to pull in and engage with the urban part of your district where most of the other guys were in the urban area and were forced out into the rural district. Um, was that a lesson for you? And, and did you guys end up with the same conclusion uh, at the end of the day when it was like that? Um, one of the, well, first of all, <laughs> I, didn't quite, I didn't quite beat Jim Hansen's record. I only had 18 years back in D.C., and he had 22. Um, so the, the second part is, and, and Lyle Hilliard said this at one of our meetings, um, I'm not an urban person. I'm an old school teacher, but I have always represented, uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not a rural person. I'm a school teacher, but I have had to represent rural areas and go in rural areas and try to understand what the difficulty of those rural areas was. And, and that was indeed eye opening for me. Um, I, I think a perfect example of what happened, and I've heard this before, if, if you remember Jim Matheson, mm-hmm. who was elected from a Salt Lake County district only on his first term, and then the redistricting t- came, took place, and all three representatives had both urban and rural together, so that Jim actually, instead of just representing Salt Lake, also represented the basin and, and wrapped around to St. George, a, a large district. And yet it illustrated how he understood that and took it to task. And people said that some of my colleagues back there said that he went from a Salt Lake representative to a Utah representative. He did take the the rural part of his district seriously. And I think he represented, at least he had offices and people out there talking to them all the time. I think you can see the same thing with, uh, with, with Chris Stewart, who has urban and rural parts. But he has spent a great deal of, of time not only living in what I would consider an urban area, but also then going out and representing the rural portions of it. If a representative is going to be stuck only in a rural area, they will not have that interface with the urban needs. And it's in the reverse. If they're only in an urban area, they will not have an interface with the rural needs. And there is historical evidence to see that, which is one of the reasons why in 2000, we specifically did the urban-rural split in all districts together. There are some other things that I, I, I have a problem with the commission. It took me a long time to get them convinced that the deviation level is significant. If the congressional districts have a deviation that is five or less, if it's over five, even though it fits with the legal requirements, it's going to be challenged in court and will probably lose. And there you will then have judges making the decision of where the lines are. And that is not what the state of Utah wants or needs. It took me a long time to convince them that the deviations had to be as close to zero as is humanly possible. And I think that's a naivete that the commission had because they simply had people who had never been involved in this process before. 
all they needed to do is take a trip down to San Juan County and see how redistricting works under a judge's uh, order, because uh, that's been a mess for years. <laughs> I'm I'm glad you said that, but I was thinking it. <laughs> yeah, I'll get I'll get in some trouble for it, but that's okay. I'll 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 live with it. Um, Carl, this is a lot of people will hear redistricting, and all the attention goes right to the four congressional districts, and it stays there. But uh, redistricting also affects school boards and and state legislative and state senate uh, districts as well. How do you solve this problem of this this urban shrink in representation? And 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 the urban increase in representation because you can't you can't split your districts up in that kind of fashion and keep them in, in you know contiguous and some of those other guidelines that are supposed to happen. So, you know, what do you what do you see as the real problem that's developed in this in this redistricting process from a state level? Well, I think you have. A, a, a real problem in representation in rural Utah because the rural areas of the state did not grow. And, and when you take the census numbers, now a representative used to, under the old guidelines, represent about 37,000 people. And now that's gone to about 43,600. So when you look at all the rural house districts and the rural Senate districts, they've got some big numbers to make up. If you take the Senate, for example, Senator Hinkins district, Senator Owens district, they were both short over 10,000 constituents, uh, with the new census data, which means that, uh, in one case, uh, Senator Owens is probably going to have to come into Southwestern Utah to pick up numbers, uh, to meet that threshold. Senator Hinkins is, is probably going to have to do a combination of maybe picking up uh, some of the southern counties and then going further into Utah County as he does now to pick up 10,000. On the House side, uh, in my district alone, I was short about uh, 6,500. Um, and, you know, it doesn't matter which way you cut it. You can start at any corner of the state. And I think Rob would verify this, whether you start in the Northwest up in, in Box Elder or the Northeast out in Uinta or the Southwest, uh, down here in iron and Washington or down in the Southeast in San Juan. Once you start moving people into various districts, there's a ripple effect and it, it pushes at some point it hits a buckle or it hits a, a dam and, and that ripple effect uh, has to stop. And so to, to make these rural districts whole is a real challenge. Now, I think uh, we've had some interesting maps presented to us. Uh, we've got some of our own that we'll present, but I think it's very important that you preserve these rural districts uh, and make them whole and uh, create districts that no doubt they're going to be larger in some case. I think my district's going to change uh, dramatically. I'm probably going to lose a couple of counties and pick up two or three new ones. And, uh, but it's a real problem when you try to try to do Senate and house districts. Now, as far as the state school board goes, that's a whole new ball game because the educational folks don't want you splitting up, uh, the local uh, education associations uh, are districts, but that's impossible as well. When you take an urban rural state and try to redistrict, it becomes very difficult. Now in the urban areas, I haven't even started to worry about those because I've been worried about preserving rural seats because I think that's an important element in this whole process. But there will be some in the urban areas that may have to have uh, runoff elections. Uh, so that kind of tells you, I think in the Northern part of the state, I think the, the legislative districts in the house can adjust their numbers from cash to box elder to make it work out. When you get down into the Southern part of the state and the South central part of the state, 
it becomes much more difficult. And a lot of these districts will change. Are you worried that they're actually going to lose representation in this process? That, that, I don't that, think we will. <clears throat> I, I don't think we will, Chad. Uh, if the legislature um, adopts what I would like to see happen. Uh, <laughs> but I'm just one vote uh, in, in a House caucus, uh, a majority caucus. But uh, we'll see what happens. I, I don't think we'll lose rural seats. Uh, but that's yet to be seen. I, I hope we don't. It'd be, uh, it would be very unfair to rural Utah. Well, my concern is that that you that you run the risk of not only losing Senate or House representation, but Senate because uh, the the court case from the 1960s mandated that parity that comes forward, and so we shifted from being a one senator per county, which could kind of balance that whole thing out, to uh, being just a a larger districted reflection of what's happening in the House. Has that changed? Do you think that's changed the dynamic of the uh, body of the Senate, uh, the state Senate, in doing that? Oh, I, I don't think there's any doubt that it's changed the dynamics up there. Uh, and you'll never get it back the way it was. That's the way it ought to be. But um, with the growth on the Wasatch Front, who's going to support that in the Senate chambers? Rob, what do we do to fix this? Uh, I, I appreciate that. Look, I one of my fears is just because of the numbers game, there will be fewer represent fewer representatives from the uh, rural areas. The difference, though, becomes that in the state legislature and and like if the, if the world were ideal, I would like to have every state representative have both urban and rural parts of his or her district. But with forty three thousand, you can't do that. But the difference is that in the legislature, all of the senators who represent urban and who represent rural areas meet together. Same thing in the House. They all meet together at the same time. They discuss things together. So both points of view are going to be represented uh, regardless of how you draw the lines. There will be some rural seats. There will be some urban seats, but they will work together which is one of the things you have to draw the lines to and encourage that to happen on the congressional level, whereas it happens naturally in the state legislature. Same thing with the state school board. I, I think the commission's maps for the state school board are, are fairly, are okay. However, you gotta remember, it's the state school board and every district has a local school board. So there's a dichotomy of representation that's there that it's not quite the same thing because the idea of the state school board is to make statewide issues, whereas for the local school board is to come up with how you actually manage your school in the local level. There's, there's kind of a safety mechanism on the school board maps. And I think there's a safety mechanism in the legislature where every element of the state is represented and they work things together. But you don't have that in the Congressional, which is why urban and rural was so important to me on the congressional level. So um, what do you, which of the maps, are there any of them that you think address the problem properly, Ron? Uh, the commission maps have, I think are very effective on the school board level because the commission did take a lot of input from schools, from both the teachers unions, as well as the administration. Um, I have a great deal of concern about the state legislature and the state house map, and that's where I'm, I'm hoping the state legislature will, will have a, a reality check on those maps and look at them in place. And as I said, there was a good map that we had for con Congress, and it wasn't proposed. I could see the handwriting on the wall, which is the reason I quit. The three congressional maps the commission set are two that, de that dominate only in an urban area, and one that was split, but it was split using political data by a private citizen. And if you look at all three of them, they have a partisan twist to them that doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out. And I th think that took precedence over the philosophy of why you want to have each congressman being able to represent both urban people and rural people at the same. Besides, I mean, the, the governor has to represent urban and rural. 
Our senators have to represent urban and rural. Supreme Court justices in Utah have to represent urban and rural. Why a congressman can't do that or has to specialize is, to me, a ridiculous argument. So there was a statement that you made uh, in in this whole issue that that basically said um, <clears throat> that the way that they are forming these, uh, while there's about a 30% uh, Democratic uh, membership across the state that one of the four districts would continually and always be guaranteed to deliver a Democratic seat. But you said that doesn't necessarily relate to how people actually vote across the state in, in other races that aren't geographically limited. Chad, that 30 percent argument was presented by almost every Democrat operative that testified before our commission. That was their idea, that because they have a minority of the vote, they should have at least one of the four, a minority of the seats, which is a cute concept. But once again, if you want to have Utah be fairly and positively represented and have some clout in Utah, I need four congressmen or four congresswomen who are working together not three against one. And that's that's that that's the mindset. So the Democrat argument of saying since you got 30 percent of the vote, which should tell me that they're not attracting three quarters of the people in their support, they should have at least one seat dedicated to them, I, I think is misunderstanding how Congress operates and what is in the best interest of Utah in Washington. And uh, and I, I'm sorry, the commission did not use political data in coming up with these seats, except for those some of them that came from from private citizens that gave us maps. However, if you have a commit, you just look at a map and see one of the maps, how it's drawn, you can tell, OK, that was drawn basically to guarantee a Democrat would always win there. And then the other three were drawn so a Republican would always win there. And to me, that was not what we should have been doing. There's also part of the law that we were given that may, that seems that the core of existing districts should be respected as much as practical. We did have a map that respected the core of existing districts and that was not necessarily, uh, in my estimation, a gerrymander. And once again, that was rejected. We rejected what I thought was one of the laws that we were supposed to follow because people just didn't like didn't like what the old maps looked like, uh, which was not part of the law we were supposed to follow as a commission. Did they, Carl, in your mind, did they get anything right in the maps they represented? Or is it? I think the IRC did a pretty good job with the state school board maps. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing's going to be perfect in this process. And that's the problem people don't understand. Uh, you know, perfect is in everybody's own mind. And that's just not going to happen. You, you try to do the best you can, whether you're on the IRC or, or whether you're on the legislative. And I, but I think the IRC did come up with some reasonable state school board maps. Uh, I think uh, the legislative committee now will, the Senate will look at theirs and the House will look at theirs and hopefully we can come to some agreement then uh, before the special session next week. I'm still very concerned about the, the congressional seats, and I couldn't agree more than than I have with uh, Congressman Bishop. Uh, you know, he's been back there. He knows how the system works. He knows what's most effective. And for rural Utah to train a new congressman about public lands and energy and economic development some of the issues that we have here in rural utah and continue to have uh, th that just doesn't work it takes the effectiveness out of of what we've gained through the years uh, and so i hope that we can come to an agreement there between rural and urban both in the house and the senate that comes up with a really good uh, congressional map uh, because I'm not real happy with the way the IRC come out on those. Well, the, these maps, quote, go public here. Um, actually, just uh, like Monday the 8th, I believe. is that So it's coming right up, and there'll be a comment period. 
Um, it, should people look at the uh, Independent Redistricting Commission website or, or the legislative? Where should somebody go if they're interested in following up on this? I think they could go to both sites and look at maps that have been presented. Uh, as you mentioned, ours will be presented Monday, and then um, we'll have some time to study those, uh, both caucuses in the House and the Senate, and hopefully come to some agreement that we can present as as a bill in the in the legislature starting in the special session on Tuesday. It may not get done Tuesday. It might be Wednesday. I think Thursday's a holiday. It might be Friday. I don't know. But hopefully, uh, you know, we can come to some agreement there uh, as members of the Senate and the House. And But, you know, people are going to say, adopt the independent uh, redistricting committee maps because the word independent justifies that. Well, as we've discussed previously here, the independent committee did not represent rural Utah very well at all. And um, I don't know how those appointments were made. I have some idea, but when, when you don't get a, a commission member south of the Utah County line, there's something wrong with that process for rural Utah. Excellent. And it's important, it's important, <clears throat> very important that we have somebody that understands rural Utah issues. Chad, can I yeah. make one last thing? The, the other six commissioners with whom I worked for most of the summer are good people and they were honest people and they were dedicated. Some of them are more realistic than others, but they were, they were all good people who did their level best. I don't have any criticisms of the, of the commissioners as individuals, but as a group, the commission was designed to, f to be flawed and to fail. And that's why I said, if you're gonna have a commission again, for heaven's sakes, you got to reorganize it so that actually it better represents the entire state and it has more expertise than the commission we had now. It, it wasn't the individual commissioners. They were very good, decent people. I've, many of them I had never met before and I've learned to really respect and like some of, the, some of those members with whom I have met and worked. But the structure of it was flawed to begin with, and it produced a flawed product. And that has to be re-looked re at if you're going to keep this process going again. And, and, and maybe, maybe the voters in 25 of the 29 counties were right when they rejected this idea in the first place. Excellent. Um, gentlemen, thank you for taking the time on the county seat underground. Uh, folks, please, please, please stay involved with this stuff. Get involved. Share the conversations. County Seat Underground is going to continue to uh, uh, have these discussions whenever we have an opportunity. And I encourage you to, uh, you know, forward it, share it with your friends. And if you're afraid to take a stand on an issue, then forward it to them and say, hey, what do you think about this? And then you can then you can start some dialogue, but uh, get it out there because these conversations are too valuable uh, to not have them debated publicly. Thank you so much, both of you, for taking the time to uh, participate in this conversation. Good luck to you and whatever you do uh, next. And <laughs> Carl, good luck or going back into the lion's den next week. Thank you, Chad. It's good to be with you. Congressman, thank you so much. As always, it's a delight to have you on. You're a very colorful descriptor of, uh, of uh, issues, both uh, constitutional and political. Now, thank you for having me. All right. We'll see you next week uh, on our next episode of The County Seat. You can find it on our website. You can find it on our Facebook page. And you can certainly look at all the stuff we've done for the last 11 years on our YouTube channel. We'll see you next time.